Hello and welcome back to the virtual classroom. I'm your host, Dr. Olmsted, and welcome to part two of our lecture on progressivism. As always, take a moment, hit pause on your screen, jot down the rest of the lecture outline, and pay particular attention to those key terms at the left. Let's get started. Now, we left off last time, we were discussing the various prongs of progressivism. We talked about things like democracy, social justice, prohibition, women's suffrage, and we're right here this idea of regulation. So the question then becomes, all these different, again, this crap, right, from the Gilded the gold-plated crap, how do we actually clean that up? Now, Jane Addams had a fine idea. But Jacob Reese presented a much bigger problem with when it came to poverty and destitution. So how do you implement these changes on a national level? Now, the, the prevailing thought there was kind of two competing forms of government here. On the one hand, you have the laissez-faire approach, hands off, right? Government does nothing. Government is extremely hands off, which is what we largely saw through the end of the 19th century. Again, we know that it wasn't really the case. They did get involved in the you know, favor of big business. But theoretically, it was hands off. That's one hand. On the other hand, there was the socialist route, in which case that the government would take over and provide what was called public ownership of businesses. So there are no more private corporations, but rather government takes them all over and everything has now been federalized. So we have these two major extremes here, right? These two extremes. And the thought was you either A or B, laissez-faire socialist. Laissez-faire socialist, hands off, totally hands on. And what happens is during the progressive era, this what was embraced by progressive reformers was neither. They said unfettered capitalism is a disaster. We have gold-plated crap. But socialism is also not America, right? That's not what they wanted. And keeping with their middle class respectability issues, they what they said they wanted was a third option, a middle way, if you will. Basically, they want to keep capitalism and keep large corporations in place. But we need to regulate them. We need to regulate these big businesses instead. Don't take them away. Don't take away private ownership. But regulate them. Get rid of the worst excesses of capitalism. And to do this, use the federal government. Let the government step in and stop being so laissez-faire and instead regulate these industrial capitalists, these captains of industry, these tycoons, these robber barons. And you can't talk about progressive reformers at the federal level without talking about Teddy Roosevelt. Yes, Teddy is back. Now, the thing is, riding a wave of the progressive spirit, Teddy Roosevelt is going to change the way Americans view the federal government. Remember, up until well, Teddy Roosevelt, 1901, the federal government, the presidency was viewed largely as, well, weak. You have a weak executive branch, the power lies in Congress and at the local level. But under Teddy Roosevelt, under Theodore Roosevelt, the federal government becomes a vehicle for progressive reform. And it will change the office of the presidency forever. Now remember, he's a Spanish War, American war hero. He was a Medal of Honor winner. He was what we would call a celebrity president in the modern terminology. He, cartoonists love to draw his caricature. He's one of the most recognizable presidents of the present day. In fact, he's the only 20th century president to be enshrined on Mount Rushmore. That's a whole other story, but he's the only 20th century president to be enshrined there. He's a hunter. He's an explorer, he's a writer, he's a historian, he's a naturalist, he's a man's man. And this, he took, he was able to take advantage of his, his famous, his fame to enhance his political clout. 
Now, in 1900, he became vice president with William McKinley. But after McKinley was assassinated in 1901, he became president at age 41, which was the youngest president to date. And Roosevelt completely departed the way McKinley had run the presidency. Under Roosevelt, we see a dramatic reimagining of what it means to be president. He was not a believer in a weak presidency, in a weak executive branch. He also is going to fundamentally change the Republican Party. Now, let's start with this foreign policy briefly, and we'll move to the domestic part, which is the bigger part of the progressive era. His foreign policy was known as big stick diplomacy. His political slogan was, speak softly, but carry a big stick. In other words, I'll tell you what, let's get along, do what I want, or if you don't, I'm gonna smack you with my big stick. And he applied this slogan very heavily to foreign policy, and even a minute adding to some domestic policy as well. But along with his foreign policy ideas of big stick diplomacy, he saw an enlargement of what it meant to be American in America's role, especially in the Western Hemisphere. Now, those of you who remember back to the first half of U.S. history, we had the Monroe Doctrine, right? That basically said, Europe European powers, stay out of the Western Hemisphere. And if you get involved, we will stop you, right? Which Spanish-American War is an example of that. Well, Roosevelt decided to add to that. It became known as the Roosevelt Colorary. The Roosevelt Colorary was an addition to the Monroe Doctrine that declared the U.S. possessed the right to, inter to intervene in the domestic affairs of any Western Hemispheric nation to quell disorder or prevent European intervention. Let me repeat that. It gives, according to Roosevelt, the United States has the right to intervene in the domestic affairs of any Western Hemispheric nation. And what is to be applied to is most specifically to Latin America and the Caribbean, which will give U.S. hegemony over the Western Hemisphere. Again, we're asserting our right as an empire. This is an extension of the Spanish-American War, the extension of getting these territories overseas, we are now asserting not direct control per se. We don't control them like we did the Philippines or the Puerto Rico, but we are asserting our political hegemony, our dominance over the hemisphere. Now, of course, the purpose of this was to prevent Europe, but in practicality, it was all about U.S. domination. Now, that's his foreign policy. Let's go back to domestic policy for a minute. You see, in 1901, in, sorry, 1902, he is going to be running for president, and he will tour the country generating support for what he called the Square Deal. And part of the Square Deal, the idea was that he's going to give Americans a square deal, which basically meant give everyone a fair shake, provide equality, and give everyone a fair chance. And he did so by outlining the three C's. He wanted to control big business. In other words, not take it over, not strip them of capitalism, private property, control big business. He wanted to provide consumer protection and conserve natural resources. Now, obviously control big business. Again, we're talking here regulation, right? But regulation was on a C, and he wanted three C's. So how do you control big business if you are Teddy Roosevelt? Well, you do so by busting up those trusts. Now, this is a very famous um, art rendition, you know, cartoon of Teddy Roosevelt. And we see him boxing literally against the railroad trust. You see, if you remember correctly, the one small thing the government did in the 19th century was the Sherman Antitrust Act. I said it was gutted by the Supreme Court and it could not be applied to manufacturers. So Roosevelt couldn't use it to break up these trusts, these monopolies, against manufacturers. But the Supreme Court hadn't ruled against railroads. And just so happened, in 1902, Roosevelt ordered the Justice Department of the United States to prosecute the Northern Securities Company. Now, the Northern 
Securities Company was a $400 million merger that would create a monopoly of railroads from Chicago to Washington State, the entire Northwest. And so Sherman, or sorry, Roosevelt wants to apply the Sherman Antitrust Act to break up this monopoly. Now, I want you to know, this was a big deal. This is the first real time that the government, the U.S. government, is stepping in to break up a private corporation. It was met with some resistance, including our old friend J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan, you know, the bank financier, who was the one in this case, because he's a banker and owns U.S. Steel. This case, though, he was the one who was financing and brokering this major $400 million merger. He offered to step in and fix the situation for Teddy, and Teddy said no. This, the, court will go all the, way, the case will go all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court will side with Teddy Roosevelt and the U.S. government, and the monopoly is broken up giving Teddy the nickname Trust Buster because he prevails against the railroad monopoly. Let me give you another example of him, of just Teddy being Teddy. In 1902, there was a coal strike. The coal miners, the union, uh, the United Mine Workers, they were walking off the job in the coal mines of Pennsylvania and West Virginia. And what they wanted, they were demanding the usual things. They wanted a 10%, or sorry, they wanted a 20 cent wage increase. They wanted a reduction of daily hours from 10 hours to 9 hours a day. And they wanted official recognition of their union. Now that's a new one we haven't talked about yet. It's a very important concept though. You see, unions were not legal. There was no law that protected unions. And therefore, one of the things that unions really needed was legitimacy. They needed to be recognized by the company as a legitimate bargaining partner. In other words, the business needed to recognize and legitimize the union so that the union could negotiate on behalf of all the workers. If the union doesn't have this recognition, and they're basically seen as just illegal, and the company ignores them. So union recognition is big. This is a very simplified version of the bigger thing. <coughs> Excuse me. So they want these three things. They want a 20, 20 cent wage increase, they want a reduction of hours from 10 to 9, and they want official recognition of their union, the United Mine Workers. Well, it reaches an impasse, and the mine owners, the mine operators, dig in their heels, and the mines become shut down. And what this fuels then and provides is we're going to have a nationwide coal shortage, and yes, winter is coming. So Roosevelt, again, government gets involved here. Roosevelt called both sides, the mine operators, negotiator, and the negotiator for the United Mine Workers Union. He calls them to the White House. And immediately, President Theodore Roosevelt is sympathetic to the workers. Yes, you heard that right. The U.S. president, for the first time in history now, is sympathetic to the workers, not the multi-million dollar owners. He became so enraged by the, quote, extraordinary stupidity and temper of the, quote, wooden-headed mine operators. Yeah, this is Teddy being Teddy. He's enraged, he actually says that these mine operators are extraordinarily stupid and wooden-headed. In fact, he went on to say he wanted to grab the mine operator spokesman, quote, by the seat of his britches and throw him out the White House window. <laughs> That's just Teddy being Teddy. Now, despite this, though, they are going to leave the White House with no deal struck. So the deal is not, there's no negotiation. Neither side will give. Nothing happens. But as they're leaving, Teddy leans in. And says to the mine operators, mine operators and negotiator and says, Hey, I'll tell you what, if you don't settle this strike immediately, we're gonna take over the mines. The government's gonna take over the mines. Now, could he really send the army and do this? Well, a congressman questioned the constitutionality of this, and quite honestly, he probably couldn't. 
But Roosevelt responded to the congressman saying, quote, to hell with the Constitution when the people want coal, unquote. Now, was this constitutional? Probably not. It probably went to hell up in court. But the mine operators were so scared that Teddy would do just that, that they settled. They negotiated and they settled. Now, did, they, did the workers get everything they wanted? No. They did not get a 20 cent increase, they got a 10% 10, 10 increase. Okay, so they got a 10% increase rather than 20. So they got half they wanted. They did get the nine hour workday, so they got that. But they did not get what they really needed, which was the official recognition of the union, which means this is going to happen again, and it's going to be much more difficult to negotiate next time as well. But again, just him threatening this, enforcing the mine owners to negotiate is a major example of the Roosevelt expansion of the executive branch of the presidency. But now, please know, Teddy does not believe in breaking up the most, most of these corporations, right? He does feel that industrial capitalism is good. It's what makes America great. It makes America's you know, wealth and productivity. He believes in at least to a higher he believes in this higher standard of living it causes. But he wants laws to regulate big business. Again, the worst excess of capitalism. What about his second C, consumer protection? Well, we're going to bring up this man right here, Upton St. Clair. And I will highly encourage you, he writes a book called The Jungle. You all should read it. It's a great read. It's easy. It's actually a fictional, it's a historical fictional book. And so therefore, it's a very well-written story. It, tell, it tells the story of young immigrants from Eastern Europe who come to, Ch to Chicago, and it shows their struggles as a family just to survive. It talks about them getting swindled by landlords who are, when they're trying to rent a house, that a house they can't afford, and that they're never going to be able to afford. It talks about how the wife is getting raped at work, but she can't quit her job. It talks about how, how bad things are in the meatpacking industry in Chicago. Because back in the day, Chicago was known for meatpacking. And of course, in this book, they vividly describe, again, I would highly encourage you, do not eat this before you eat your lunch or your dinner, or maybe not afterward either. Make sure you, do it, you know, don't do it when you're super hungry or just ate. You might lose your lunch. And the thing is that what happens is he talks about these putrid, horrible conditions in great detail. Because he actually did research, he actually went into the Chicago meatpacking industry and did like a journalist, and did an investigative study of these things for more than a week. And what he found was, like, these men are standing in pools of blood all day long. It's cold in Chicago winters. They're working, they're literally shivering, carrying these huge knives that will slip and cut hands off. And of course, the hands kind of get mixed in, the blood gets mixed in. And then they take that beef after they butcher it and they throw it into a warehouse room that's not refrigerated. And it was said that if you went in that room, it was pitch black and you couldn't see anything, but you would run your hand across the top of the meat. Your hand would not be covered in blood from the animal, it'd be covered in rat droppings. Because rats were rampant, running through all over the meat, potentially peeing and pooping in the meat as well. And this was the meat that they were selling to the American public. In fact, this was the meat that was sold to the U.S. soldiers during the Spanish-American War that caused so many to get sick and some to die, including some of Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders. And so, remember, there's, there's very few laws regulating food production, very few laws regulating pharmaceutical drugs. And as a result of this, we start seeing people like Up in St. Clair. He's a muckraker, right? He writes a book called The Jungle. And he exposes these horrible atrocities of the Chicago meatpacking industry. Now, The Jungle was published in 1906. It became an immediate bestseller. It's still in print today. And after this became a bestseller, depicting these horrible living and working conditions but also how tainted our meat was, and the public outcry was just tremendous. And so Teddy Roosevelt steps up and says, hey, let's fix this problem. So in 1906, Teddy Roosevelt will pass the Meat Inspection Act. 
And again, that says, yeah, maybe we should, you know, actually have regulations. People go in and inspect that the meat is being handled properly to prevent people from getting sick from it. We don't want Americans dying from bad meat. They also passed 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act. Because maybe you should know what's in your food you're about to eat or your medicine. Because you'd hate to have the great cure you see in front of you, cocaine, toothache drops, instantaneous cure. For sale by all druggists. Maybe having cocaine given to kids who are teething is not a good idea. And so the Pure Food and Drug Act, the Meat Inspection Act, which will ultimately form into what became known as the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. And again, the whole point here was to get rid of using unhealthy additives, get rid of the use of, quote, filthy, decomposed, or vile, something, yeah, they were using decomposed animals and others, things, in your food and your drugs. And so the FDA, of course, is this very famous creation. And there's some faults, of course, but it's about government regulation of our food and drugs. This third C was conservation. He was a strong supporter. Of, yes, he was a hunter, but he was also a naturalist. He believed that we should leave America a better place. And part of that was preserving our natural resources so we would have it for our children's 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 children. <clears throat> and so he authorized... He did the unthinkable here, right? He's, he's crazy, right? He hired experts in the field for government positions. Like he said, yeah, I'm not hiring my best friend or my son or my son-in-law or my daughter to run my cabinet positions. Instead, he didn't bring in his cronies. He brought in experts in their field. So if you want someone to run the FDA, bring in someone who actually has a medical degree. If you want someone to you know, deal with museums, bring in a historian. If you want someone to take care of, you know, wildlife, bring in people who are experts in their field. And scientific expertise became the standard of our country. And you see the stats there, he will set aside 50 wildlife refuges, five national parks, and set aside 172 million acres of protected forest. You know what's funny here? The old guard Republican, you know those laissez-faire Republicans that really love big business, they didn't really get mad at Teddy for regulating big business. They didn't get mad at Teddy for consumer protection. They got mad at Teddy for conservation. Why? Because they said this is an overreach of government power, blah, blah, blah. But what they were really concerned about was they could no longer get kickbacks from the sale of federal land to private business. A corrupt practice, yes. It, they got so mad at Teddy Roosevelt for conservation efforts that in 1907, congressional conservatives would pass an act that would curtail the president's power to create new federal land reserves. Teddy, just being Teddy here, before the law was put into effect, Roosevelt responded by seizing 17 million more acres of land. Yes, that's Teddy Roosevelt. Now, unfortunately, fortunately, to your perspective, in 1908, it's a new election year, and Teddy Roosevelt could have run for re-election. Remember, there's no term limit back then anyway, but he only served less than two full terms because he took over for William McKinley after assassination. By 1908, Roosevelt decides that he's done. He decides he does not want to run for re-election. He wants to take a break. And so he fully supports his Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, to be his successor. And Taft will be hand-chosen by Teddy Roosevelt, because he, Taft had worked really well with Teddy, gave good advice when it came to some different policies, both foreign and domestic. And Taft had been a strong supporter of Roosevelt's reform initiatives. And therefore, Roosevelt felt Taft would carry on his legacy. And so, Teddy decides he's going away for a while. 
Taft will be easily reelected. And before we get to the nits, nuts and bolts of his presidency, let's talk about some fun facts about William Howard Taft. First of all, he is the heaviest president in history, weighing over 300 pounds. He was also the last, so as the heaviest president, by the way, there's a very famous story that he actually got stuck in the White House bathtub. He's in there taking a bath, he gets stuck in it, and they have to basically break the tub and get him out. Yeah, heaviest president in history. Second thing, he was the last president with facial hair. Yeah, see the nice mustache? He's the last one with facial hair. Think about that. It's, it's always astounding my students, like, like, wait, seriously? Yep. No president since William Howard Taft has had a mustache or a beard, goatee, no facial hair. They're all clean shaved if they want to look good on newspapers and television. Third fun fact about Ta or William Howard Taft, he is the last U.S. president to have a milk cow at the White House and actually go get milk from it. Yes, he actually got fresh milk from a milk cow at the White House. There's Taft's cow right there. Other than that, quite honestly, Taft was not a great politician. He was very cautious. He was very conservative by nature. And despite giving good advice to Teddy during his presidency, he's kind of a pushover, which is kind of hard to do at 300 pounds. But the reality is he, while easily winning the election over our old friend Williams Jenny Bryan, 1908, he will choose corporation lawyers rather than progressive reformers for cabinet positions. And what is Teddy doing this time? Teddy went on a safari to Africa. Yes, Teddy's being Teddy. Now, here's the thing. Taft gets a really bad rap, and for some very good reasons. In, in a very short time, he pisses off Teddy Roosevelt. You know, he's on safari, he pisses him off, because one of Taft's things he did was replace all these experts in their fields with cronies, with um, these, cor these corporation lawyers with, you know, backdoor deals rather than experts in their field. And one of the people he replaced was Teddy Roosevelt's good friend, Gordon Pinchot, who was the chief of the U.S. Forest Service. So Teddy's mad now. And so what we see here, of course, this cartoon shows that he is going the wrong way from what Teddy had set up. The thing is, and yes, he is kind of a pushover. The old guard Republicans were able to kind of control Taft in a way they could not control Theodore Roosevelt. But if you actually look at the numbers, he will actually bust more trusts than Teddy Roosevelt did. So he still does continue some things of Teddy Roosevelt, including busting up trusts. So he, in some ways, is still a reformer, progressive reformer, even though he's going to kind of turn the other direction and not really embrace it, instead choosing corporation lawyers. But this all leads up to the 1912 election, which is a pivotal election in history. You see, in 1912, the election embodies the spirit of progressive politics in a way no other election in history will do. Because there were three candidates, yes, three, three candidates who ran on progressive platforms. And then there was the Republican Party. And so we have four candidates total running for president. We have the Democrat, Woodrow Wilson. We have a third party candidate, Teddy Roosevelt. He's back because he's ticked off at Taft. We have the incumbent president, Republican, William Howard Taft. And then we have the Socialist Party candidate, Eugene Debs. I told you he'd be back. Now let's take a minute. We'll talk about the other three in a minute, but let's talk about this fourth party candidate here, Eugene Debs. Eugene Debs was the kind of leader of the Socialist Party in 1912. Now, as the leader of the Socialist Party, he became, remember, he started off as a labor organizer. He becomes very, very radicalized in the 1880s, and he's a very charismatic speaker who embodies kind of the principles of the American Socialist Party, which, remember, the Socialist Party of America was not some far radical extreme left. Were they farther left than, say, Theodore Roosevelt? Well, yes. 
but they don't embrace anarchy. They do not embrace overthrowing the government and replacement of the government. What they want to do is to be respectful of the American political process. They want to be respectful of the American cultural and religious traditions. And they see themselves as saviors who are going to use the government to regulate business. They're confident that the U.S. can be redeemed. They want to clean up that excess crap. But they want to do more in a quicker manner than, say, Theodore Roosevelt did. Now, spoiler, he's not going to win. But as a Socialist Party candidate, a fourth party candidate, he will win 6% of the popular vote, the largest for the Socialist Party in history. And by the way, he'll continue being a major prominent political figure. And he will urge people to dodge the World War I military draft. He will end up being put in jail. And in 1920, he'll run for president again. And he'll win 3.4% of the vote from a jail cell. Eugene Debs. So he's out. So now we're down to three. So we have the Democrat, Woodrow Wilson. We have, that's the Democrat party. The Republican party, though, is now in disarray. Because back from safari, Theodore Roosevelt is going to challenge Taft's nomination. So Taft is the incumbent. He's up for theoretically re-election if the Republican Party chooses him. And Theodore Roosevelt challenges the nomination of William Howard Taft for the Republican candidacy, the Republican presidency. And so... He thinks he has a chance here, but those old guard Republicans who didn't like Theodore Roosevelt turn the Republican Party against him. They like the direction of the new Republican Party, which is a theoretically just a big business party. And yes, if you want to know when we start seeing that shift in the political parties where the Democratic Party embraces big government, and the Republican Party embraces small government, look no further than 1912 election. Now, it's not finalized here, done, done deal here. It's a process over time. But the 1912 election is kind of that turning point election. And so as he's rejected, which he figured he would be from the Republican nomination, Theodore Roosevelt enters into a third party known as the Bull Moose Party or the Progressive Party. And he argues for, let's see, federal regulation of big business, yeah. Social welfare program, ooh, that's something new. Direct democracy, we talked about that already, right? Worker compensation, ooh, I like that one. Income tax, well, I don't really like that, but it's important to pay for things. Minimum wage, maximum hours, equal stuff, wow, you go, Teddy. The new nationalism. And you may be thinking to yourself right now, okay, it's the Progressive Party, but why is it called the Bull Moose Party? Because Theodore Roosevelt once said that he is as strong as a bull moose. And the fact is, he was able to prove that. No, he'd not get into a wrestling match with a bull moose. But while he was speaking, touring the country, campaigning for president, he was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He was just about to get up to go walk on the stage to give his speech when suddenly an assassination attempt came and they shot him right in the chest. Yes, Teddy Roosevelt was the victim of an assassination attempt. The shooter shot him right in the chest. But this is Teddy being Teddy. Teddy Roosevelt did not go to the hospital. Instead, Theodore Roosevelt walked up onto the stage, up to the podium, and said, Ladies and gentlemen, quote, I do not know whether or not you fully understand, but I have just been shot. But... It will take more than that to kill a bull moose, unquote. You see, what happened was the bullet went into his chest right here, but it first went through his steel eyeglass case for his glasses. Then it went through a 50-page single-folded copy of his speech that he was about to deliver, and the bullet slowed down enough to just become lodged in his chest muscle. He looked down, said, hey, he's not bleeding out, therefore he must be okay to deliver his speech, and he did. He gave a 90-minute speech with a bullet lodged in his chest. 
Gotta love Teddy. He went to the doctors afterward and he said, well, apparently you were right. We can't, you were fine. You gave the speech and we actually can't take the bullet out because if we did, it would probably kill you. And he would actually carry the bullet in his chest until the day he died. Now, for better or worse, when the election comes in, there, there sets in this, in this election kind of a standard thing, which is who's going to vote for Teddy Roosevelt? Who's going to vote for William Howard Taft? Well, theoretically, you're going to get some progressives, maybe middle of the road that will vote for Teddy. But the bulk of both Roosevelt and Taft, the voters are going to be Republicans. And so what happens is you split the Republican Party vote. Some go to Teddy, some go to Taft. And there's a general rule in elections. If a party's vote is split between two or more candidates, who's the winner? The other party. In this case, Woodrow Wilson. Now, Woodrow Wilson, we'll talk about Woodrow Wilson in a minute. He's the beneficiary of this Republican Party split between Teddy Roosevelt and, of course, William Howard Taft. But it's important to note a few things about this graph here. Number one, the split definitely benefits Woodrow Wilson. Number two, though, William Howard Taft didn't even take second place. He took third place. Yeah, the incumbent president of the United States of America took third place in his run for re-election. It's the only time in history has ever happened. Third thing about this, if you count the votes up, remember there are four different candidates, three of them running on progressive platforms. There's Eugene Debs, there's Woodrow Wilson, and of course, Teddy Roosevelt. If you add up their numbers, 75% of all votes cast in the election, popular vote, were for progressive candidates. So if 75% of the votes went to reform progressive minded candidates, Wilson, Roosevelt, and Debs. Apparently America liked this new larger government, more active federal government. They liked this idea of progressivism and progressive reform. So we have a new president, who is he? Well, Woodrow Wilson. His running platform was known as the New Freedom. He believed in trust busting, lower those tariffs, and break up Wall Street. So what does he actually do? I, I tell you, he got to work right away. He sweeps into power in 1913, January, or sorry, actually in March back then, they had the inauguration. He becomes president, and his election represents the high water mark of progressivism. It also gives Democrats full control of Congress and the White House the first time since the Civil War. As the Democrats control the majority in the House, the Senate, and of course the presidency. 1912 election also changed the tone of the Republican Party forever. The Republican Party was no longer a progressive party. Those who favored Theodore Roosevelt now swung Democrat. And in their place, the Republican Party became the party of big business. It's a conservative pro-business party for thereafter. So what does Wilson do? He gets to work immediately. In 1913, one of the first things he does is pass the 16th Amendment, which, of course, is the graduated income tax. So we want to pass some reforms, expand the role of government. We need money. So... Let's levy a graduated income tax to offset the losses caused by reducing the national tariff. Now, like I say, graduated income tax means the rich pay more percent than the poor. This is the first time we've had this in history. But please note, what made him so popular was he favored the common man. Anyone who made under $4,000 a year paid zero taxes. So basically all farmers and factory workers were exempt. Individuals making from $4,000 to $20,000 paid a 1% tax. And then it rose on increments all the way up to 6% for those who made over $500,000 a year. But this becomes the foundation of our modern tax system and officially created the IRS, 
which even though it had technically been around for a while, it became a permanent institution thanks to Woodrow Wilson. He also passed the Federal Reserve Act, which probably is one of his most important accomplishments because the Federal Reserve Act is what shored up our banking system. See, Wilson was elected and it was universally agreed upon that the banking system in America needed to be altered, overhauled, fixed. Progressives wanted public control. And of course, big corporations wanted private control like JP Morgan. But Wilson worked out a compromise that, inc that included both private and public control. In the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve Act of 1913, again, one of the most arguably the most important thing of his tenure, the Federal Reserve Act strengthened the nation's financial structure. And basically what it did, it divided our country. And by the way, this is our first national banking system, sorry, central banking system since 1936 when, you know, Andrew Jackson gutted the bank and got rid of it and killed the bank. So what it does is it divides the nation into 12 member districts. And these district banks at each district were able to loan money at low interest rates to other member banks. Why is this important? Because there's a Federal Reserve in Washington that's in charge of all these 12 district banks who will then, those district banks, loan money to member banks in the individual states in their district. Why is this important? Because the Federal Reserve is, a, is able to then regulate our banking system by raising or lowering the interest rate on loans. You hear about it every so often. You heard about it actually a few months ago, if you're near the beginning of the coronavirus you know, quarantine period. In about April 2020, you heard that the Federal Reserve was cutting the interest rates down to basically zero. Why? Because they wanted to stimulate the economy by allowing banks to give out more loans so people go buy things to help stimulate the economy. And so basically the Federal Reserve Act is a government mechanism to regulate the economy. By raising and lowering the interest rate, the Federal Reserve can do this. They, they can then kind of help stop those, again, worse excesses of capitalism, stop price gouging, and create a kind of a national stability in currency. It creates a national universal system of credit. But it does represent a substantial increase in government control of banking. Oh, by the way, he will also help pass the FTC to help regulate Wall Street. He will also pass the Clayton Antitrust Act of 1914, which, of course, helps replace the, the failed Sherman Antitrust Act, which allows Wilson now to go after manufacturers. So get, break up those trusts, manufacturing trusts, and break up these monopolies. That's the good side of Woodrow Wilson. Now, in fact, by the way, under Woodrow Wilson, there will be four constitutional amendments. We will have the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th Amendments all under Woodrow Wilson. These are very four very important amendments you should know. The 16th Amendment was the income tax. The 17th Amendment was the direct election of senators. Remember that one from the populist and progressive platform? Yep, that's under Woodrow Wilson. So 16th was your income tax. 17th is the direct election of senators. The 18th, of course, was prohibition. And the 19th, of course, is women's suffrage. Now, these are very four important amendments. Now, if you remember back to the Reconstruction lecture, I gave you a mnemonic device to remember the 13th, 14th, 15th, those Reconstruction amendments. It was free citizens vote. That way you can help remember that. So, you know, we had the no more slavery, free, so the 13th, the 14th, citizenship for African Americans, and then voting rights for African Americans, the 15th. So now we have the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th. Income tax, direct election of senators, we have the prohibition of alcohol and women's suffrage. So remember these, so you give money to senators for booze and broads, or booze and women. So give money, income tax, to senators, direct election of senators, 17, 18 for booze, alcohol, prohibition, 
and 19th to women. Suffrage. Now, despite all these tremendous progressive accomplishments, again, high watermark of progressivism, there was, however, a very problematic side to Woodrow Wilson, and that is, to be blunt, he's a racist. He's a Southern racist Democrat. In fact, even though he technically publicly courted the African-American vote, ultimately he is in fact a very hardcore racist. In fact, he will have a private screening of the horribly racist film known as Birth of a Nation. And this Birth of a Nation movie was released in 1915. Woodrow was going to have a private screen at the White House. And basically the movie portrays the KKK as the savior of the South in response to black rule, specifically the black rape of white women. And after watching this movie that was viewed by some Southerners as a documentary, Woodrow Wilson said, it is like writing history with lightning. And my only regret, it is so all terribly true. That, in other words, that the KKK saved the South, supposedly. Yeah. He's racist. And again, his idea of progressivism, which it was some tremendous policies, again, give credit where credit's due. He did some great things for domestically for our country. Foreign policy was a little more iffy because he tried to, you know, when we had, remember, Teddy Roosevelt had big stick diplomacy. Taft had what was known as dollar diplomacy. We should invest money in Latin America. Woodrow Wilson wanted to apply what he called moral diplomacy. So he wanted to take these progressive ideals and apply them to foreign policy and known as moral diplomacy. Treat people with respect, just not African-Americans. And here's where we really see the limits of progressivism when it comes to, especially Woodrow Wilson. You see, um, Wilson wanted American foreign policy to be guided by idealism rather than crass national self-interest. Unfortunately, this will be tested immediately in the Wilson presidency by two major wars. The first one, of course, is the Mexican Revolution. The second one will be World War I, that's the next lecture. So let's just talk for just a brief minute here about the Mexican Revolution. Now, in case you don't know, in 1910, the Mexican people were fed up with their pseudo-dictator, Porfirio Diaz, and they overthrew him. Now, there were three kind of factions of guerrilla-style fighting that were fighting on behalf of the people to overthrow Porfirio Diaz. The first one was Victoriano Huerta. Now, Victoriano Huerta became the new Mexican president after the ousting of Diaz. However, no one really liked him either. He kind of still represented the establishment. And so the fighting continued by two separate groups of Mexican fighters. The first one by Vestiano Corranza and the other one by Pancho Villa. Now, eventually, Carranza will actually overthrow Huerta and take over, but Villa feels like, again, the people are not being represented. He will continue fighting guerrilla-style warfare. In this bloody Mexican Civil War, the Mexican Revolution, that will take place from 1910 through 1921, the entire decade is consumed by war. The issue here was that during all these transitions of power from Diaz to Huerta to Carranza, what was being consumed here was the government takeover of privately held land by foreign investors, both European and U.S. investors. And when Woodrow Wilson backed the Carranza government, Pancho Villa basically just went all out hatred on Woodrow Wilson as well. Because again, he's trying to felt, well, hey, Carranza is better than Huerta, so let's support Carranza and this government and provide stability in our southern neighbor. Wilson, that is. Pancho Villa was still leading this kind of warfare. In 1916, he turned against Woodrow Wilson. 
1916, in January 1916, Pancho Villa is going to abduct 18 Americans riding a train in Mexico and slaughter them, kill them. Then, just a short time later, he gallops into Columbus, New Mexico. Into the, he crosses the border into the United States and he kills 19 people and burns the town. So now, you're the U.S. president, what do you do? He killed 18 Americans in Mexico, which that's bad enough. Then he crossed the border into the United States and killed 19 more and burned the town in Columbus, New Mexico. What do you do if you're Woodrow Wilson? You go get them. And so Wilson orders 6,000 U.S. troops to cross the southern border into Mexico to hunt down Pancho Villa. Whoa. This is a problem. This is a big problem. You can't just send your troops into a foreign country. This is an issue of national sovereignty here. It's an act of war. Now, for his part, Carranza had to say, well, sure, come on in. Because if he didn't, Wilson wouldn't support his presidency, his rule. For the next two years, General Pershing led 6,000 troops all across the northern desert of Mexico, trying to hunt down Pancho Villa and could never find him. He became an urban legend because he evaded the U.S. troops for two years. Finally, after two years, Carranza said, no, 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 get out. This is our country. Get out now. You've been here long enough. And Wilson would oblige because he has to. And he'll pull the troops home. But this episode poisoned the U.S.-Mexican relations for the next 30 years. And this Mexican so-called intervention, U.S. troops in Mexico, was seen as a disaster for U.S. foreign policy. As it turned out, apparently, moral diplomacy is hard to implement. But as his attention is on Mexico, we have an even bigger issue that is brewing in Europe, which of course is World War I, the topic of our next lecture. So until then, take care and bye-bye.